Uh, welcome, AEW Unrestricted. Another awesome episode today. Uh, we've got Adam Page along with me, Aubrey Edwards, and my favorite co-host. It's probably called the Jolie co-host. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Who are you again? Alex Marvez. <laughs> There he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's AEW Unrestricted. We're here today with uh, the wonderful, wonderful cowboy himself, Adam Page, uh, oh, AEW flag. World Team, World Tag Team Champion with Kenny Omega. Uh, you won the Men's Casino Battle Royal back uh, double or nothing last it's year. Been a, wow, it's been a year. Yeah, it's been a year. It's nuts. It's been man. a year. Uh, ROH World Six Man Tag Team Champ. That's true. Uh, yes. You've got some <laughs> CFW Mid Atlantic Heavyweight Champion and the Tag Team Champion. So okay, you've got a bit yeah. Of a... <laughs> wow, yeah. I, <laughs> the, yes, the, yeah, that did happen. <laughs> yeah, you uh, you've done quite a bit, which is awesome. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I like to I like to think so. I like to hope so. Anyway, just just pretend. I mean, you wrestling's know, yeah. all perception. It's right? the biggest so. thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In reality, though, uh, it's been a good run, hasn't it? It has been. Yeah. Um, so surprising. I think when I like started wrestling, I didn't like. I had no intention of doing this for a living. I just kind of thought this is fun. And at some point right. it started, you know, like becoming a living and yeah, hell of a run. So all of a sudden. Cool, man. So you describe yourself as an anxious millennial cowboy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Is that like how much of that is gimmick and how much of that is like actually you? Um, a hundred percent me. Uh, <laughs> That's me. Um, you you have met me. You you guys both have been around me. I'm a very uh, anxious type of person, uh, both big, big picture and small picture type of anxious as well. Um, right. So yeah, I think you know in in three words. If I had to give you three words to tell you who I who I was, those are my three. Uh, you're a Virginia guy. Yeah. Good, there we good are. job. I know you went to Virginia Tech. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I worked really Virginia. hard to be born here. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> I'm from Virginia, and uh, oh, sorry. it's true. Yeah, Aubrey doesn't know anything about that. Uh, yeah, she and you went to Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, up in the mountains. Two years, you graduated from college. How in the world did you do that? Holy shit! I did. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just honestly smarter than everyone else there, so I just did it in two years, <laughs> um, as opposed to. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, right. No, when I went to high school, we had um, like all these uh, dual enrollment classes or whatever where you mm. get college credit. And um, my mom at the time, she like worked in the counseling department. So she like knew all this stuff and would like kind of tell me, OK, when you go talk to your counselors, tell them you have blah, 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 this and that. So she kind of helped me like figure out, you know, that I didn't need to take these English and history classes again. I was just taking my major classes and managed to, you know, scheme Virginia Tech out of uh, two years tuition and get out of there. <laughs> Where'd you Sweet. go to high school? What high school did you go? Uh, Halifax County in Virginia. Okay. That's right. uh, that's where I'm from. I, that's where I taught as well when I was teaching sure. high school. I moved okay. back home and taught there. So uh, you made a lot of student films, so I hear. Um, I, well, um, I guess when I was, <laughs> I was maybe uh, four, 14, 13, 14, uh, a buddy, uh, Adam, who's who's real, he's the real Adam. Uh, the real Adam. The this, this story, uh, we... Uh, we, I don't, we just hung out a lot and we were bored and we decided we were going to make a movie and we ended up making uh, two like feature length films. You know, they're like an hour and a half long movies. Damn. Um, so then I kind of figured, well, I have to, you know, I'm going to graduate high school. I guess I have to go to college. That's what I'll study in college. So, you know, made some um, little videos and film stuff there. I mean, I never, I, I kind of realized once I got into college, it wasn't my passion at all, but mm -hmm. I, I did enjoy it, you know. Um, and I think my real passion was just kind of like dicking around and making stupid videos with my friends, which is somehow <laughs> what I've ended up doing for a real career. Um, yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, it worked out. It ends up paying the bills. It's not bad. Right. <laughs> you mentioned you were teaching. Uh, I always, I, I could never be a teacher. I could never put up with somebody else's kids. But in reality, you weren't that much older than somebody else's kids, right? Yeah, no, I wasn't much older at all. Um, <laughs> right. So I finished Virginia Tech and uh, walked and got my diploma at 19 uh, yeah. and turned, turned 20 that summer. Sure. And the, the guy who was teaching uh, some of the art classes at the high school quit, I think like three or four days before classes started. Um, so they're in a mad scramble and uh, nobody else in Halifax County, Virginia had an art degree, obviously. Um, so they, they called me and I was like, uh, I, yeah, sure, I'll figure it out. I don't know. I didn't know what the hell I was doing uh, right. <laughs> for the first while. Anyway, I like to think I figured it out. Uh, a little bit after a while. 
I think um, that's what being an adult is, is realizing yeah. you don't know what you're doing, but figuring it out. Right. Yeah. I think you're in that point in your life where you start to realize like, oh, the, the grownups, like they don't really know anything. They're just kids who have been doing this longer. Um, but yeah, I got there in there in the classroom, didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but honestly, teaching for me was never too difficult. Like I had it easy. Uh, I taught journalism classes and uh, graphic design and multimedia classes. So these kids were sitting in front of, you know, IMAX all day. I would teach something for a day i'd give them a project the next day and then for three days i just sat there and worked on their projects or played games online it was like it was it was easy it was okay not bad at all no so let's talk about transitioning from uh the real world to the world that you're in right now you know you you said (laughs) that the fake one (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah it's the uh it's not fake it's predetermined yeah okay no that's right choreograph world that you're in right now uh talk about that transition uh, you um, said you you said you really didn't want to be you didn't have any desire to be a wrestler, right? You just kind of was. Well, I, I mean, it. I guess all I ever, you know, from the time I was maybe, I don't know, eight or nine, I got into wrestling big, and uh, I probably watched wrestling for three weeks before I decided, like, oh, I'm gonna go get on the trampoline in the backyard and we're gonna put on shows. You know what I mean? Right. I transitioned to that part quick. Did backyard wrestling shows and stuff for a while. Sure. Um, And when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15, uh, my cousin was dating a guy who was uh, an indie wrestler. So he was wrestling, you know, like in front of 50, 20 people, um, you know, kind of close by. So I started traveling with him, training with him uh, and started wrestling in high school, uh, pro wrestling in high school. And um, I mean, I I just I wanted to be a wrestler. Sure. I never really intended. I didn't think I'd actually make a living. I didn't think I'd do anything. I thought I was just going to do this in these armories and it was fun. And that's all I really cared about uh, until you know, started to have a little more success as, as time went on. Do you have a so backyard wrestling a, name? Yeah. What's that? Do you have what a backyard, backyard wrestling, wrestling name? Yeah, what oh, was your God. name? Well, <laughs> so uh, uh, me and my buddy Adam, it was typically, it was typically just us. Uh, we had some other friends kind of cycle in and out for a few shows, but it's typically us. So there might be three matches. Uh, the first one would be me versus him. Uh, the second match would be both of us in masks. And the third match would be both of us in different masks and, and costumes. Uh, I was uh, a superhero like Hurricane Helms. My name was Kid Kryptonite. I was, that was one of them. Uh, I was also Blade. I was into the dark arts. Um, mm. And then I was just me as a, as a third character. I think those were probably my only three that I can remember anyway. So you end up mentioning that like there's you, Adam, and then there's the real Adam. So you're using your buddy's name for your persona. Like, how does he feel about that? And how did that come about? Um, I mean, it probably like at this point, it's just not really a a thing to consider anymore. Um, But I guess when I was, uh, you know, getting into pro wrestling when I was in high school, um, I needed a different name. Uh, So I I just took a lot of, you know, people's last names and first names and just put together a long list of just jumbled up names that really meant nothing. They were just made up names. And that was the one I picked was Adam Page. It was his first name and uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, his last name. And that, oh. that literally, that was it. <laughs> just like, yeah, that sounds cool. Whatever. Yeah, we'll cool. That's, that'll be my name. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. And well, you know it, what? It, I, I kind of thought like I, I had too plain and too like, like kind of a weird, boring of a name. But then I probably picked maybe, maybe the most boring fake name I could have picked, you know, to follow it. I, I think it's a it's an easy name and it's a memorable name. Sure, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, to me, uh, uh, Cowboy Adam Page, Hangman Adam Page, however they want to call you now, just kind of rolls off the tongue. So, yeah, at know. this point, it's you know it's established. It's whatever. Sure, yeah. established. Exactly, exactly. What well, in your in your background in your training, there's a name that that stuck out to me because I know him very well as Jimmy the Boogie Woogie Man Valiant. <laughs> yes. Um, because I used to stick the microphone in front of him, and many times he would kiss me. Uh, and uh, that was kind of how I was first known. <laughs> Kissing Jimmy Baggett. <laughs> He's a very, very uh, unique person, isn't he? He is. He is, uh, he is a real sweetheart, uh, a genuine sweetheart. Um, yeah. And when we, you know, we did the um, tribute to these Memphis legends when we were there. Uh, and right. he was, you know, one of those guys. And somebody I hadn't seen in years who you know, remembered me, remembered my name, remembered, you know, everything about me. He came to me, sought me out to say hello. He's a real sweetheart. Um, yeah. But when I was in college, you know, I found out that his wrestling school was like 20, 30 minutes away. So I would drive up there. And honestly, I went for the first time uh, because I wanted to make uh, one of my school projects about him, a video about him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I essentially showed up with the camera equipment and like my my school 
project partners. And instead of actually making the video, I just put on my wrestling gear and got in the ring and did the training that day. Wow. <laughs> so I really didn't do anything filming. Um, and I went up there and worked with them a little bit. Um, at that point, uh, he was a little more hands off with the actual training. You know, he had sure. guys that he had trained in years past doing the training. And these were guys that even at that point, I was starting to like wrestle on these independent shows. So I knew these guys anyway. So I was kind of at that point beyond the point of needing like a trainer. But for both of us, you know, I was able to say, you know, after hanging out with them, going to his school stuff, I was able to say, yes, I was trained by Jimmy Valiant and people knew who that was. Sure. And I, I needed that. You know, if I go to these Ring of Honor camps, I need to be able to tell them, oh, Jimmy Valiant trained me. Um, right. And honestly, I think it was symbiotic as well. He probably, you know, needed every so often to be able to say, I trained this guy. Um, and I mean, there was some of that, you know, as well. But kind of at that point, I was I was already rolling. You know, the world has changed a great deal as far as tryout, wrestling tryout and wrestling camps are concerned. And I say that Jimmy uh, Valiant is very old school. Not so sure how he started, but I can remember back in the day when he was wrestling and guys wanted to become pro wrestlers, they would come to like the Charlotte Coliseum in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Gene Anderson would just beat the shit out of them and make them run the <laughs> stairs. And if they lasted and came back the next day, maybe they had a chance. I'm sure that didn't happen at Jimmy Valiant's camp. Well, well, can you just briefly describe what the camp was like? Uh, you know, Jimmy Valiant's camp, I would describe it as exactly opposite of that. Uh, yeah, okay. His <laughs> camp, there were guys who were probably 60 years old there. There, wow. were, there were people who were legitimate children uh, mm. learning to wrestle there. It was very much um, a a kind of uh, a staple in the community for people who were lost or otherwise wayward uh, wow. to just show up at his door. At, it was, the training school is at his house. You know, it's just a yeah. little, little building outside his house. So you just show up at Jimmy Valiant's house and say, hey, guy, I, I want to learn how to train to wrestle. And he'd say, okay, come on in, wow. baby, and we'll That's do awesome. it. So it was, yeah, it was almost the exact opposite <laughs> of, uh, you know, Gene Anderson beating the hell out of you when you show up. Right. So you were doing a film project uh, with Jimmy. Did anything ever come of that? I mean, it's on YouTube. Uh, um, I, I'm pretty sure we got a good grade on it. Uh, <laughs> I, end, I ended up doing two of them. Uh, I did one like the next year on my own, I think. Um, but nothing, you know, other than like, turning them in for my class project and putting them on YouTube ever really happened. They're there if you want to watch them, you know. How long did you train with Jimmy Valiant? How long did that go? Um, just, I mean, kind of all, you know, I would go up there sporadically for the couple of years I was at Virginia Tech. I couldn't have, I couldn't say I went more than 10 times. Okay. Um, and, you know, I would see him at some of those, in the, he got me on some like independent shows up in that area as well. Right. There wasn't, right. you know, and there still isn't much wrestling in Virginia. So, I didn't really know those people. Um, most of the stuff I didn't know was in North Carolina. So he sure. kind of got me on some stuff up there as well. Right. That's the old Mid-Atlantic Territory. It really is. The Carolinas and Virginia. It is, yeah. And it's still, yeah. uh, you know, typically, you know, North Carolina still and South Carolina is still kind of hot. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. We are talking to Hangman Adam Page. And the Ring of Honor, Ring of Honor called and said they wanted to sign you. And that's where we're going to pick up the story with Adam Page on AEW Unrestricted. This is AEW Unrestricted. Me and Tony Schiavone are here talking with Adam Page. Uh, we mentioned a little bit about Ring of Honor, taking a couple of their camps and whatnot, did a couple dark matches. How did it go about with them actually giving you an offer and signing you? Um, God, I don't, honestly, I don't remember. I'm sure someone, <laughs> someone gave me a phone call. I don't know. Uh, I do remember actually signing my contract. It was the day um, I showed up for TV um, and it, me and Silas Young were in, I, I guess maybe Silas had already signed or something. I don't know. We had a match on TV and they told us like, you got like five minutes, but just go ape shit in five minutes. So we did like a bunch of crazy stuff uh, in five minutes. And I remember I signed my contract, uh, I think after that, that evening um, and got started there. I want to throw out a couple of names to you uh, and uh, how they influence your career uh, and what you learned from them. First of all, guy that works behind the scenes for us, BJ Whitmer. Oh, uh, yeah, very uh, instrumental in my career. And you know what? Uh, I guess I would like to talk about the decade, uh, the thing that we did in Ring of Honor there as well. Uh, sure. Him yeah. and uh, Jimmy Jacobs and Roddy, uh, they were a, a three-man group called The Decade. Uh, their whole deal was about, you know, like teaching these young guys to respect the older guys and, you know, respect Ring of Honor and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and when I started Ring of Honor, I might have been there like five or six months. I was floundering, honestly. I was just kind of like playing – cowboy or not even cowboy guy i had a trucker hat um but i wasn't even doing anything creatively uh and jimmy jacobs had the idea to bring me on as their uh young boy um 
So I was honestly kind of pissed off about the whole thing when it started uh, because I thought like, this is so demeaning. Um, <laughs> but I kind of realized after a couple of weeks, like if I'm going to do this, I might as well do it right. And started wearing like little track suits and carrying a towel and a bucket of water for those guys. <laughs> and, like they did a whole character and, and decided to, you know, make a whole character arc out of it, you know, young just boy. The, sure. right. Just kind of like come up through the ranks as their young boy and what ends up happening to me at the end of the, the thing. Um, and BJ was excellent to work with, with all that kind of stuff. He had tons of great ideas, still does. Um, and somebody, yeah, really good to bounce stuff off of. Okay. So you go to new Japan pro wrestling, uh, uh, in, uh, June of 2016. How was it for you in Japan? Uh, weird. <laughs> How? Why? Uh, I don't know. I'd never been to Japan. I don't think I'd ever, other than just like a trip to Toronto, been out of the camp, uh, you know, out of the country. Um, so it was strange. Uh, and it was obviously, you know, the, the wrestling culture is different. Um, and right. you know, when I got the call that they wanted, you know, they're interested in me in New Japan, stuff like that. And I was going to go and do this three week tour to start off with. I didn't know that much about New Japan, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, my knowledge about them was kind of limited. So I was trying to like hurry up and learn who everybody was and what they did. And that's like a big learning curve. Uh, you know, like getting there and you're wrestling these guys and you kind of like, you don't really need to know them yet. You don't even know what they do and those kind of things. Um, so trying to you know just hurry up and figure out who everybody is, what everything is, and how the hell do I fit in here, you know, and try to figure out your spot. And it took some time, uh, honestly. I like to think that I was kind of starting maybe to carve out you know, a little spot for myself there by the time I left. So it maybe took that long. I don't know. Hmm. So you've got New Japan, but that also kind of brought about your position in the Bullet Club. Right, right. Um, and that was uh, genuinely the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, getting put with, you know, Matt and Nick, uh, you know, Adam Coles and was joining the Bullet Club too. Um, He's dead now. Yeah, who, who is? Yes. Uh, God rest his R. soul. R.I.P. Yes. Hmm. That's good I mean, me. it's the best thing that ever happened to me uh, <laughs> to work with yeah. those guys who were not only like on a run, but, you know, I, I came to realize the more I worked with those guys, we saw eye to eye on a lot of things. They made me realize a lot of the, the things that I thought about wrestling that I didn't know that anybody else felt this way about them. I was able to, you know, feel that feel validated in that way. You know, when we would go to shoot little stuff for BTE and I thought, oh, we should do this. We should do that. And it felt right for once. You know, Oh, mm -hmm. this is this is great. This is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, BTE became the real in thing, the real cool thing. I thought for wrestling, it. Uh, I think it's it's in reality, it's what helped get AEW on the map. It don't is, yeah. Um, I I think uh, you know I I don't have any intentions of quitting wrestling anytime soon. Uh, I got you. Good, but, but <laughs> now uh, I even think that by the time I get there, looking back, uh, the stuff that we started doing with BTE and, and and everything that blossomed from it will probably be one of, if not like the biggest point in my legacy, my in, in my career. Um, right. And not even like that I was the guy doing it. We all had fun doing this stuff together. Um, but you know, a, a lot of stuff came out of that. Uh, you know, a lot of memorable feuds. A lot of stuff where, like, when we were with Ring of Honor, um, people would show up, and we were starting to like attendance was you know going through the roof. And the people there weren't necessarily concerned about what we were doing in Ring of Honor. They would be chanting about me killing Joey Ryan or whatever yeah. the hell was going on. So like, <laughs> you, you like, holy shit, we're on to something. We're filling these arenas, and it's. I mean, Ring of Honor is doing a great job, but it's us. We're doing right. this. This is where exactly. this is coming from. It's just um, nice right. to have that validation. That, like, it is, yeah, this yeah. This stupid thing you're doing with your friends is like people are really into it. Right, and we never, you know, it never felt to me like we were setting out to do something grand. It really just felt like a bunch of friends sitting around, joking, dicking around about, you know, oh, you know, what if, you know, what if Hangman got jealous about Joey Ryan's penis size and, and they, they had a feud about it? Or, mm -hmm. you know, oh, what if this, what if that? Oh, what if, uh, you know, what if we, oh, what if we did like the Raw invasion? It feels like we're starting to get that big. What if we like made fun of that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it was never really, you know, I guess a quest to be anything grand. It was just us dicking around. Right, right. And, you know, uh, it really... I don't know. If, I can't remember. I'm where, I was there. I don't know if you were on the card, but it's the, it was the driving force. I really think that helped sell out Madison Square Garden during uh, WrestleMania weekend. For sure. Yeah. The, yeah. I know Cody and the Bucks were, were supposed to be on that card, then they weren't. Were you on that card? And I mean, we're not. I probably would have been had I stayed right. there. You know. Okay. Um, because we, I guess that show was announced and even sold out. 
probably right. before we left Ring of Honor, maybe. I, I'm not quite sure of the timeline. Right. Um, I'm me neither. But then we left. Uh, so we, right. you know, I guess people would have assumed we'd have been on the show, and I'm sure we would have been. Um, right. But we left, you know, before that show actually happened. Sure. So, you know, and, and I don't mean to take, you know, all the credit for anything like that. But, right. um, you know, selling out that kind of arena, something that's not WWE at that time was was huge. Um, and Incredible. certainly a lot of it had to do with Ring of Honor. A lot of it had to do with how hot New Japan was and, and those guys, uh, too. All right, I want to throw another name out at you because he's a real good friend of mine. He's he's not with our company right now, and he is out of his freaking mind. Okay. His name is Luke Gallows. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and uh, uh, where did he uh, – what did he have to do with the name Hangman? Um, probably everything, <laughs> which is weird because I don't really know him. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> no, I don't know him that way. No, I, I, I met him one time. Uh, <laughs> so you don't know he's, you don't know that he's out of his mind cause he is. I mean, he's oh, I'm, incredible. I'm sure he yeah. is. I could have told, yeah. I could have told you that much. Uh, right. <laughs> everyone in wrestling's a little crazy. So. Oh, we're right. all psychos. Yeah. I was thinking about yeah. earlier today, how, how weird this is. Um, but probably everything to do with the name hangman, you know, I guess they, uh, him and Anderson uh, and AJ had just left and you know they they New Japan knew they were bringing in Adam Cole to be in the Bullet Club uh, and I guess I was suggested as the other person right but so you're gonna have Adam Cole and Adam Page who both looked kind of similar had similar wrestling styles um, and Adam Cole was like main event ROH guy at that time so I was going to have to do something a little different and that was kind of the suggestion to me from Gato you know my name and I kind of thought like oh the name Hangman would be cool like if I have this noose like he used to have or whatever instead of being Gallows I'll be Hangman whatever that was that was about that me telling you that story was probably about as much thought was put into the the whole thing at the time because I was just so excited to get over there and get the thing going. Well, it worked. Right. (laughs) Those are the things that work right? I mean they really are sometimes you just it's off the cuff and you go with it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, sometimes it's sometimes it's someone else's idea. Sometimes it's your idea. Sometimes you don't even have time to think about it. You just have to hurry up and do something, which right. was kind of the case at that time. All right. You mentioned Joey Ryan. Talk about that. Uh, the BET storyline, the BTE storyline about uh, killing him with your boots. Um, so. God, a lot happened here. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. Did you make him drink your pee or did he drink your pee? Oh, it's funny. Funny oh. you bring that up. Uh, I, Jeez. I, uh, I drank his urine. That's uh, okay. For, forcibly drank his urine. Forcibly. Uh, yes, forcibly. Uh, after I took the dick flip, um, the whole thing started off with. So when I joined uh, <laughs> Bullet Club and was starting to kind of work with Matt and Nick and Ring of Honor, uh, I remember we did one of our like local t. You know, Ring of Honor was on like local, you know, local channels at 11 a.m. or whatever. One of our little TV promos. Uh, was me and them hanging out and, and they were asking me like, wow, I was called hangman or whatever. And, uh, I can't remember. It's anyway, the joke at the end of the promo was that it was about my penis being large. Right. Cause you were hung. <laughs> that, you right. Yes. Exactly. That was, right. that was the joke. Um, so that, that became uh, a character trait, uh, for a while there. Um, and we had the idea that obviously Joey Ryan being who he was, uh, that when they started watching these videos of Joey Ryan doing the dick flip, cause I started to really become a thing that I would get jealous about it because I was the guy with the dick, not him. <laughs> um, so that's what happened. And that's, you know, something that I don't, and for me, that is like not to toot my own horn, but a, a, a piece of character consistency that even then I was insecure about my place in this group and that this other guy, Joey Ryan, they thought he was funny and thought, thought he was cool because he had a dick. No, I don't think so. So that's where that all kind of started. Uh, and a lot happened from there. Um, and it ended up in what was attempted murder. I actually didn't end up killing him all the way. Attempted, uh, okay. Attempted well. murder, yes, mm-hmm. yes. He never actually perished. Uh, I certainly thought he had died um, I think we when all I left did. him. That's the difference, Your Honor, between murder and attempted murder. You right, yes. right here. Thank God Absolutely. it never went to court. Okay. Uh, let's talk just a little bit about All Out in Chicago. Uh, when did you hear that Bucks and Cody started talking about this this event, which kind of set the stage for everything to get rolling? Oh, so for uh, so for the first All In, I I don't remember exactly. Man, I, I wish I wrote this stuff down because I don't remember when I heard the first thing about it. I'm sure that the idea had started to kind of get hatched at some point, uh, you know, b- before I kind of knew anything about it. Um, but as soon as it did, everything we did, you know, for BTE, we started to think about, well, if we're doing this on BTE, how can we make it pay off? You know, I guess we had we had being the elite and you can have the payoff on the show, 
but it, it felt like it was gaining so much steam. There had to be like a bigger arena for this to pay off in, like a live wrestling show for some of these things to pay off in. Um, and I think I was probably in the middle of the Joey Ryan thing there. And we we're trying mm-hmm. to figure out like what I would do for, for All In. Uh, and I wanted to wrestle Joey Ryan because it just felt natural. It felt right. Uh, I think Matt and Nick <laughs> were, were more concerned with, uh, you know, wanting me to have a, a good match, not about uh, dicks. <laughs> So, so you there's a good match about dicks. Well, you can, you can, and, and that's what I like about wrestling uh, is that you can have a good match <laughs> about dicks. But I guess in this one occasion, they uh, wanted something a little different, and we decided to do something with Joey Janela, which, looking back, I think it was a great decision. Um, oh, it was a fantastic he, match. He was on fire at the time, and the match was great. I loved it. Um, yeah, excellent. Yeah, that that has to be your best memory for that night, right? That Chicago street fight. Uh, yeah, you know, that was my match. We had a great time. Um, Joey just got absolutely murdered. He took some insane stuff in that match. Mm. I'm surprised. Uh, I mean, I'm always surprised I don't die, uh, but I'm very surprised he didn't die. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, my favorite memory from that evening though, uh, is after I got dick flipped by Joey Ryan, we had the 10 Mm -hmm. inflatable penises, uh, the druids, the 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 druids. Yes. The penis druids, uh, hoist me out. (laughs) and carry me out of the arena. And I remember uh, as they were carrying me out, I was laying, yeah, yeah, face up <laughs> on, on my back. And I couldn't see the crowd or see anything but like the ceiling of this place and all I could see. It. So I was totally in tune, like just listening to how insane it sounded. And what a strange thing this was. I wish I had like a, an aerial photo pointed straight down at that. Um, it was such a, such a strange thing, but that was my favorite moment, knowing that we had crafted something over a year Right. That somehow made that weird thing really, really mean something. Uh, right. And that is what I enjoy about wrestling. It's one of the things that people talk about that show. Right. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think when you think about All In, you, that's like one of the images you think about is me getting sure. carried out by uh, inflatable penises. Great visual. See? Film school. <laughs> doing it's all a, that yeah, i guess it all, it all comes together <laughs> yeah it, it really it really does all come together um and uh also do, do you do some editing on being the elite i know that brandon does most of it do you do any of it on your own uh i do yeah um typically the stuff that i do on bte or at least a lot of it i'll i will shoot it and edit it and send it uh, send it to Nick and he'll just pop it in there. You know, if it's okay. stuff we're doing together, it'll just get filmed on our phones. There's sometimes some more like complex stuff that, you know, Nick could probably figure out how to do, but it might just be easier if I do it because I, I kind of know how to do some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, when we did uh, Marty saying complicated by Avril Lavigne, he sang that. So he, and, and I wanted to put together that montage. So everyone's was sending me this footage and Marty's singing the song, but he didn't listen to the song when he sang it. So he's all out of tune. He's, his speed would like speed up and slow down. And it was really weird. And I wanted to put music to it. So I had to like find the like little MIDI, uh, I guess, I don't, MIDI, whatever it's called, you know, mm-hmm. like karaoke track for that and like speed it up, slow it down to try to match, you know, how Marty's singing. So those kind of things I would, uh, I would like to do when we, you know, when we do stuff for BTE. Fantastic. So we talked a little bit about BTE, your time with the Bucks, talked about uh, All In. And obviously, that's all going to go to the craziness that is AEW. So we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. This is AEW Unrestricted. We're talking to Adam Page. Talked a little bit about ROH, New Japan, the Bucks, Kenny, All In. All of these things that are just kind of like building and building and building. And eventually, AEW is a thing. So when did you first hear about AEW? Um, Boy, I'm always afraid I'm going to say something that's like too much. Like, I, yeah, I'll we'll, too, we'll too edit much, post. but I'll do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was, you know, uh, who our bosses are. It doesn't matter. Right. right <laughs> yeah. Um, I was in Japan at the time uh, for G1. And uh, I remember we were in Tokyo because I was staying at Tokyo Dome Hotel. And I remember which gym I was in, uh, the little Ginza gym. And uh, I was texting Matt and Nick because. I think we were like halfway through the G1 and I'd probably got approached by, you know, different people from new Japan, you know, kind of asking me like, Hey, you know, are you going to stay with ring of honor? Because we're kind of interested. I think they were kind of maybe interested in me becoming like a full-time new Japan guy. So it's just kind of mentioning to them that like, Hey, you know, new Japan is talking to me a lot. And I think they might be interested in signing me, you know, kind of exclusive here. Um, and Matt just texts back. He said, don't sign anything. Let me call you. <laughs> I was like, okay. That's so, uh, yeah, so he uh, he either called me or texted me, I can't remember, uh, and told me, 
you know, that, you know, Tony had approached these guys and, you know, was interested in bringing wrestling to TNT and you know, starting AEW and all these kind of discussions that maybe have been happening for, I don't know, two or three weeks at that point, but I just wasn't privy to them yet. Um, and I think I got on the phone with Tony that day uh, after I finished my workout, still outside the gym and talked to Tony for the first time. Um, and it happened right there. That was it. And I kind of, uh, I'm sure, you know, negotiations could have went one way or the other, but kind of after hearing his vision for what he wanted to do and all the things involved, I kind of knew right then, I thought like, this is what we're, we're all going to do this for sure. No question. How long so was your you, phone call with him? Yeah. Uh, I, he's a talker. It, yeah, he's a talker. Uh, uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so, you know. That's I, impressive. Pro- it, but you know what? It was probably 98% Tony because this all came out of left field for me. So I didn't know what to say. Mm-hmm. I just thought I was just shut up and listen. Uh, <laughs> so it's probably just all him talking for 20 minutes. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. I think we all can see that. <laughs> I think, him. yeah, yeah. You, you could all see that. Yeah. He's a very engaging guy. There, there's, there, there's no question about that. Listen, you wrestled in the very first world title match against Chris Jericho and uh, Jericho became the champion, but the fact is that when you look back in the history books, that's something that no one can take away from you. That's really a big moment in this uh, in this company's history. Right. Yeah. To be in that first title match. Um, yeah. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I didn't win it, obviously. Uh, well. And it set me down a, a, a course uh, that has led me to alcoholism. Uh, but, <laughs> but I should uh, laugh at that. It's a real serious matter. It is a serious matter. Um, but it is something, I guess, in the history books uh, that mm-hmm. you cannot take away from me that I was the mm-hmm. loser of the first ever AEW World yeah. Heavyweight title match. Here's something they can't take away from me either. And I really think this, and I think most fans feel this as well. You wrestled in, I think, the greatest tag team match I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. And, Thank you. Uh, That's the, sweet. And I, I don't I necessarily want to jump around. We like to keep this in chronological order. But what happened in Chicago with you and Kenny and the Bucks was something that we will never forget. And I've been doing wrestling for ages. I've never seen anything like that. You had to be very happy and probably hurting a little bit as well coming out of that match. I was just relieved it was over. Um, <laughs> I couldn't enjoy it in the moment. Really? To, to some wow. degree. To some degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are times when, you know, something happens and the crowd goes apeshit and you realize, oh, okay, this is good. But that moment is fleeting because you got to do the next thing. Um, so I was relieved to, to physically, physically get through it. Um, mm. But as soon as I did, I knew we had done something special. Um, and, you know, I, and honestly, it didn't matter to me what most anyone else thought of it. I knew that I had told a story, mm-hmm. not just in the match itself, but for months and months, I had told a story that I've long wanted to tell. And I was feeling fulfilled in knowing that I had done it. You know, we had got to the finish line of that story in that moment and it was done. I had done it and I was proud of it. Yeah. Was there a moment in the match? I mean, you knew it afterwards, and I knew it by by calling the match. You can you can almost feel it, right, with the crowd, mm-hmm. and and I know you're in a different spot than we are in the back, but uh, you can almost feel it that man, something's clicking here. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, and for sure, it wasn't even like during the match. I think probably by the time we had done our entrances, and the music stops, the lights come on, and mm-hmm. there's nothing but four guys standing in the ring, and the crowd is maybe more engaged in that moment than they are during the VTR, during the entrances, Mm -hmm. that's when, you know, you got them. Um, And that's from then on out, you know, the rest is going to be easy. If they're already interested and you're just standing there, the rest will be okay. Yeah. Great chemistry with Kenny Omega in the ring you have. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I didn't, (laughs) I didn't intend to have good chemistry with him. Um, I I might've even on times tried uh, not to have good chemistry with him uh, out of spite, but yeah. We work well together, apparently. Right. Uh, so we'll yes, keep doing do. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dean Malenko, uh, he's uh, one of the coaches behind the scenes. Uh, one of the uh, one of the great jokes of all time back in the WCW days was he would come out as the Iceman, and he would look very serious. He would, you know, he would grab his wrist and he would walk to the ring and look very serious. But I knew there was not a serious bone in his body. <laughs> There's not. There's not. It, no, it's there's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, just uh, talk about 
Talk about working with Dean behind the scenes because I, I know you've worked with him closely. He's just amazing. Yeah, he's great. Uh, he's a really funny, dry sense of humor type of guy. I thought he hated my guts when I first met him, but it didn't take long to figure <laughs> out. Oh, it's just that's just how he is. Uh, mm -hmm. He's cool. Um, I don't know. I don't have a lot of you know very hands-on stories with him uh, because he's one of our agents um, or, or or coaches and right. Genuinely, uh, I like to just do whatever the hell I want to do and hear what people say about it when I get to the back as opposed to listen to somebody up front. And Dean does have very good feedback. I, I would be the first to admit that, you know, getting back after a match, Dean will tell you something and you go, oh, well, yeah, yeah. okay, all right, okay. He's right. He's but right. I, I don't like to listen on the front half, no. Right. <laughs> uh, I want to go back to All Out and talk a little bit about this horse because cowboy shit's sort of becoming your thing. <laughs> so how, like, how do you go about saying, okay, guys, I'm going to ride in on a horse? Probably in those, those exact words. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I just like, yeah, I want to ride in on a horse. So I tried to figure out, you know, okay, where does a performing horse uh, come from? Because certainly I can't ride one of like my dad's horses out, out there. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, where does this happen? You know, I looked up, um, I think uh, like rodeos and rodeo promoters uh, up in the Chicago area found a guy who lived in uh, Wisconsin. Um, so got to talking back and forth with him. He uh, owned a horse whose name was Stoney. Uh, Stoney was in some of the Batman movies. Stoney was in uh, some other TV shows about Chicago, like Chicago Fire or PD or something like that. I don't know. He's, he's a movie horse. He'd done a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Um, he's worked a lot. He, he yeah. did a lot of work. Uh, so he, yeah. He, he knew what the deal was. And honestly, <laughs> compared to a lot of the things he'd done before, uh, All Out was a very tame night for him. Uh, okay. So I got to meet, you know, meet them. I drove up and uh, hung out with Stoney and, and uh, the guy. And uh, a couple of days before All Out, you know, just to just ride him a bit and get the feel. He showed up, you know, good and early that morning. We did a few run throughs and just rode a horse out there. Yeah. You know what, though? The. Um, he was more, Stoney was more afraid uh, during the rehearsals than he was during the actual show with the people there. Really? Hmm. Really. He, he really, he genuinely was. Because I think by the time we'd done a few rehearsals of me riding the horse out, he kind of figured, okay, nobody's going to mess with me here. This is cool. This is all right. He was getting his footing. They laid down some padding for him to walk on. Um, and I think, I think it like rained a little bit that day. So he was really nervous about walking outside in the rain. So kind mm. of getting, getting inside from that and then figuring out that this is an okay place to be. He was cool. Yeah. And he's pa he passed, didn't he? He has passed on to the great pasture in the sky. Yes, mm. he has. Mm. God rest his soul. Right, God rest his soul. He, uh, yeah. Yes. His owner, uh, Frank, his name is Frank, texted me. I think a couple of days after he died, I sent them a, uh, Sent in a gift box in the uh, in the mail, a little That's condolences very kind gift of you. box. Yes, That's very great. kind of you. Yeah. Big part of my life, Stony. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, what we got going on now with you and the drinking and people chanting cowboy shit and there's you know you grabbing beers at ringside, which obviously in the what we're doing now we're, we're not really really doing much of that because of what's going on. But that to me, you you get as big a response as anybody now when you come out. Thank uh, you. That's sweet. Don't you agree with that? I mean, you really do. I, uh, you know, I like to, I like to think I'm doing all right. You know, I don't know. I'm my own worst critic. I would never even admit if I thought like I was the best. You know? Well, okay. But uh, what I'm saying is I'm not saying you're the best, but I'm saying that you are, you get as good a reaction as anybody. And you have to know that when you come to the curtain and that music hits and we hear the horse gallop, Fans react to that, and mm -hmm. they start chanting cowboy shit, and they want you to, want you to have a beer with them. There are signs for you. Uh, you've body surfed out <laughs> out of the out before. I mean, it's just the the people are really into this, right? I mean, yeah, you got to know that. Yeah, something's working. Um, and genuinely, you know, I've always felt this way that if you leave, you know, if you tell a wrestler what to do, you'll get results. Um, mm -hmm. But if you leave a wrestler to his devices, they're gonna they're going to sink or they're going to swim. Uh, right. And a lot of times I think you can swim a lot better when somebody just throws you out there than mm -hmm. if they try to teach you how to do it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, some of the things, you know, in earlier in my career, even some of the things I've done in AEW weren't like genuinely my ideas. They weren't, they weren't maybe totally from the heart. Um, but 
you know, I think when I started doing all that stuff, maybe November, December or so this past year, um, I, I knew I had a story I wanted to tell and it came from me. And every, every single Wednesday is a fight to make sure that what I'm doing makes sense to me and it feels true to me as a person. Because a lot of things you'd see on our show about my character on BTE, yes, they, you know, there's fictionalization, but it is genuinely real. You can't be me and, you know, not feel the way that this character truly feels. And that's how I truly feel as a person. So I know that I have this story inside of me and I want to get it out. And this is how you get it out. This is how you work through it. Um, so fighting every Wednesday to make sure that the things that I did or things anyone around me did uh, made sense with this story uh, is what I think makes it good. And the insight that others around can bring into it as well. So I kind of want to dive into that a little bit more. So you've got, you've been involved with BTE for a long time. And then we talk about kind of the creative process at AEW and you making sure that the character speaks to you and all that. Uh, are there any similarities between the creative process for BTE and AEW? Are there any differences? Like are you just throwing out it's, shit? And... It's genuinely pretty much the same. Uh, cool. Somebody will throw out an idea. Somebody else will throw out an idea. I'll throw out an idea. It's a collaboration. What you end up seeing is not just one person's idea. It's a lot of people's ideas that somehow get meshed and molded together. Um, some people might be represented, their thoughts might be represented more than others in instances. Um, but genuinely it's the same. Uh, the creative process, at least in my experience for BTE and AEW is largely the same. Uh, the only difference being that with AEW, it's not just a few people, it's a whole lot more people involved. There's a lot. There's a lot of people mm. involved, yeah. Which I, th I think makes it more challenging. Makes it yeah. more difficult, right? I mean, but that's just the nature of the game. Big time wrestling, buddy. And a lot of people are watching now. So, yeah, that's right. I get it. Yeah. I uh, want to talk to you about your Spotify playlist. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, the Anxious Millennial Cowboy Spotify playlist. I, I did. I, I started paying for Spotify so I could do that. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> clearly, that on quarant reason. clearly on quarantine, I've been out of my mind. <laughs> right can't judge people during a uh, quarantine uh, you, can you, you, you can can you just off the top of your head give us some uh, some artists who are on there i i noticed we don't see any led zeppelin jimmy page on there no i didn't um i mean i could i don't know i felt i would stick more to the my my cowboy theme uh, a bit mm -hmm. uh musically uh i'm a large fan of you know kind of outlaw country music uh um, sure i'm a large fan of a guy named orville peck uh who i'm a i'm a really big fan of um some other you know, country or country adjacent uh, musicians that I've just started to kind of get into, honestly, during quarantine, just flipping through and hitting, hitting every little button after suggest the next thing, suggest the next thing. Oh, these are some right. things I like. Um, sure. I don't know. I, I, th I like things that are counterculture in their own way. Things that kind of flip the script a little bit, things that are mm. a little outlaw, you know, in, in whatever way they are. It's kind of what, a what AEW is trying to be. And honestly. Has yes. Yes. That's yeah. kind of what the idea <laughs> Exactly. Thanks, buddy. It's You're really having a great awesome. career, man. Hell yeah. You Missing really him. are. All right. Hope to see you soon. Real you soon. too. I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you soon. All right. Our thanks to Adam Page. <laughs> and don't forget, you can subscribe to AW Unrestricted Podcast for free wherever you get your podcast. And what are we doing on Wednesday nights there, Aubrey? Wednesday nights, Dynamite, TNT. You can watch it every week, 8 o'clock, 7 central. It's awesome. You should be tuning in. If you're listening to this, you're probably tuning into Dynamite. But just a general reminder, it's really, really fucking good wrestling. you damn right. So for Hangman Adam Page, I'm Tony Schiavone. I'm Aubrey Edwards. Thanks for listening to Unrestricted. Unrestricted.